The three are fallacies that manipulate language, fallacies that change the subject, and fallacies that manipulate what data. The only thing is that fallacies that change the subject and those that manipulate the data are, are broadly categorized under what? Fallacies of irrelevance. But for your purposes, just learn the raw categorizations, the fallacies that manipulate language, those that change the subject, and those that manipulate data. Please continue, Malik. Fallacies that manipulate language. Equivocation, using different meaning of one word in the same context, as though they mean the same without notice to the to your audience. Example, I don't see why women are always complaining that they do not enjoy the same freedom as men do. It is a free country. So what's the problem? Everyone in Ghana here is free to do what they like. Very good. We saw this already. I don't need to comment on it. I told you when we're doing it uh, in topic three. I've introduced you to it in topic one. But then in topic three, when we're discussing vagueness, uh, equivocation, ambiguity, I, I touched on this. So you know equivocation. What, what word is the, the speaker equivocating on? Uh, anybody would want to react? Free. Free, Free very good. It's equivocation. Free. Yes, yes, that's correct. I saw some example be somewhere. Uh -huh. Someone says, Amy is madly in love. We know that mad people should be institutionalized. So Amy should be institutionalized. I take it again. Amy is madly in love. We know that mad people should be institutionalized. So Amy should be institutionalized. <laughs> Can you see that that is equivocal? Somebody. Somebody react to that. If if it's equivocal, what is the person equivocating on? Mad. Very good. It's mad. 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 Good. Very good. And institutionalized. No, it's mad. We said Amy is madly in love. See, then the next premise says mad people must be institutionalized. When we say Amy is madly in love. Then the next premise says, mad people must be institutionalized. Therefore, Amy must be institutionalized. The, what is happening is the person is thinking of Amy being madly in love. The way we use the word mad for Amy, when we say Amy is madly in love, the person wants to think of that sense of mad as she's madly in love with, with what? She's equating that sense of mad to being mad as in you have lost your brings but they are not the same there are different uses of the word mad when we say amy is madly in love are we saying amy's brains are not working now it's just an expression that means what what does that mean put up your hand please if you know it so when you see equivocation again it's not that way, but they said topic three will not come this equivocation is repeated now in the when we are arguing and we are being equivocal. So it is an informal fallacy, a fallacy that manipulates language. This time, not just the raw, uh, you know, logical error of equivocation that we've seen, but when we do that in argumentation. So you can see equivocation again. Don't come saying that, but doc, you said unit three will not come. But yes, it's equivocation, but of unit 10, no, not unit three. You see that. So let me let me get feedback from the class, please. When I say Amy is madly in love, what does it mean? What about us? Anybody? Okay, I see a third hand. Zoe. Madam, she's deeply in love. Deeply. You see, not that she's, her mind has become sick, that she has to be taken to asylum. Oh, okay. Man. But the second use of that, I, I just saw it somewhere. That's why I said, oh, let me use this example to help my people remember their equivocation thing that we learned. 
Amy is madly in lab. We know that mad people should be institutionalized. They should be taken to an institution for help. So the person concludes, therefore, that Amy should be institutionalized. This is an equivocation on the word mad or mad. It's a fallacy of equivocation. It could have come. Then I ask you, pay a discussion of unit 10 informal fallacies. Assess the following passage. If I want you to be very strict, I could say in a single statement, uh, in a single word only, what crime, uh, what, what fallacy, if it, one word. But if you do that, then sometimes maybe the person could have thought around it and written it. That, oh, the person is using the different senses of the word mad in the same context. Uh -huh, then, so you can give the mad. Otherwise, it would have been a possible answer. Then if you get it wrong, it's wrong. Because someone might think it's ambiguous. No, it's not ambiguous. It's equivocation. The meaning of madly, as in madly in lab, is being equated to the meaning of mad, as in mad people, sick people in the head. All right. That, that is an example. Just to buttress what uh, I, my lady read for us. Let's go to the second fallacy that manipulates language. What is happening? The person is playing. Manipulating means is playing on the use of that word. He's manipulating the, the language, the word. Okay, equivocation. Another one that manipulates language. I'm teaching you with a lot of experience and grace that only God gives. If you learn it well, you learn the whole unit fingertips easily and can apply it, not just through poor pass and forget, but you can understand it to pass it on and, and apply it and see it and detect it in a very uh, what, an accessible way, not too technical. That's what I'm trying to do. So you, you now know at least one fallacy that manipulates language. It's an informal fallacy. Which one is that? Why we, do we say it's informal? There isn't any specific law of form that has been disobeyed, no. The fallacy committed is not as a result of disobeying any specific rule of deed action, no. Okay, so it's an informal fallacy. Which specific type are we dealing with? Oh, we are dealing with uh, uh, equivocation. Where would you place equivocation if you were grouping them, if you were categorizing them? Oh, I would have placed equivocation under what? The fallacies that manipulate the language. They play on the language to confuse the one listening to them or persuade them without actually giving them reasons. They play on your emotions or whatever. We are going there shortly. Okay, so this is one of the fallacies that manipulates language. Your book gives you three. Fallacy of equivocation. The second one is what is on the screen. Auntie, read for me, please. Secularity. Secularity. Pathology. Begging the question. These are Explain. other names for it. I'm coming. These are other names for it. When you look into your textbook, you see another name for secularity, mm -hmm. apart from tautology and begging the question. That name is Latin expression, petitio principi. You, you see it in the test. You just know. That's the technical. Hey. Uh, okay. Now that's the video, bro. Petitio principi. P E T I T I O. The O R two. So in the in the law court, when people want to sound or like the way they say amicus curia or something like that, they use the Latin. They could say uh, objection, my lord. My my colleague is committing petitio principi. Is it sustained? Rephrase. You know. It's circular, which are going in circles. It didn't give us the answer. You use the very answer to repeat, uh, uh, to answer the question. You don't have an answer for the question, so you beg the question. You repeat the question in the answer. That is what we mean. If you remember when we did definitions, we saw circularity. To be moral is to lead a morally upright life. If I say that, I'm defining what it means to be moral. Uh, yes, what does it mean to be moral? So when, when people lead morally upright life, that is what it means to be moral. What have you said? You said nothing. You only repeated the definition. You mean the definition? Yes, you saw it. When we're doing definition. So if you go and see circularity again, don't say, ah, but doc, you say unit two will not come. Why has unit two come here? We are doing fallacy in argumentation. And instead of giving us reasons to support your claim, you only repeated the very question that you are, uh, the very claim you are trying to support. Where? in the reasons you offer. Okay, Sister Reed. Explaining, defining or giving reasons by merely repeating the very word or claim you are trying to explain. 
define or support. Example, yeah. The, yeah. the belief in God is universal because everyone believes in God. Can you see the secularity in it? When you hear because, uh, expecting that the person is going to give you the reason why be the belief in God is what universal. The belief in God is universal. They are saying that it is applicable everywhere. People believe in God everywhere. That's what you are saying. Then we ask you why. So we said it is because Oh, yeah, because you are looking for the reason why people everywhere believe in God. Then the reason is because everyone believes in God. That's what the person says. Look on the screen. That's what makes it secular. He didn't add anything, friends. Okay, so it's secular. It's just like saying he is famous because he is well known. If you say he's famous because. Because, yeah, well, I don't know why I mean because. Because he's looking for the premises, the ground, the justification, the reason why he is famous. And when we, we are waiting for you to give us reason, they tell us because he is well known. That's secular. You didn't add anything. Tau Logos, it begs the question. It commits the petitio principi fallacy. Which type is that? It's one of the fallacies that manipulate language. Which one was the first one with manipulated language? A fallacy called equivocation, where you oscillate from one of the meanings of one word to the other, as if both meanings apply in that context. So you are repeating the word, that's equivocation now, you're repeating the word, but you are using a different connotation. And you want to suggest that they are the same, by like the way you are using it. You create equivocation. You know it very well now. So we can move on to the next slide, the third one. Sister Reed. Pseudo precision. Pseudo precision. Pretending to be precise. You remember the word pseudo? We saw pseudo when we did unit seven. Pseudo scientific statement. When we did unit seven, pseudo scientific statement, we saw the word pseudo. So pseudo means pretending, pretext. Pseudo position then means pretending to be precise. That suggests that the argument, the person is manipulating language in a way that will portray a certain sense of what precision, which cannot be because of the nature of the concept you are using. You are, you are dealing with a concept that is not precise of it. So you're pretending to be precise. It's just a manipulation of the language, a manipulating language. It has another name, mathematical mystification. You mystify us. What do you mean? They're using the mass to scare us, to make us, everybody works up when they see mathematical figures. Okay, 66.99% of COVID-19 patients are spiritually motivated. As soon as you see 66 when this percent of this, everybody shuts up because it suggests a certain kind of precision, exactness, definiteness. But our concern is that look at what we are trying to ground, much spiritual motivation. It is a vague concept. Remember vagueness. It can be, how can you clearly specify and define spiritual motivation? How? How can you do that? You see that it is not a straightforward matter. So if you come and say that 98.65% uh, of COVID-19 patients are spiritually motivated. And you want us to think that, let me the EGRC test. And you want to, I want to get some direct examples from the test book for you to add to what we have done. Those who don't look at the test book at all. It gives you several examples. That's why I always point you to that, which are examinable content. Okay? So that is the problem. Pseudo precision tries to give a certain suggestion of precision or exactness to a term. That is already vague. So when you are reasoning and you do that, you create the fallacy that manipulates language called what? Pseudo precision. Its other name is what? Mathematical mystification. That's the third type of fallacy that manipulates language. Any questions? Let me go and see if there are hands up. Okay, let's get another, another reader to take off on the fallacies that change the subject. That is the second group. I told you that you should have in mind three groupings. 
of informal palate. Those that manipulate language, we have just finished with those three. We are moving to those that change the subject. We are fallacies. But which, what do we find wrong with those fallacies? The, the, the fallacy arises because the speaker is shifting our attention from the main subject under discussion. There is something we are focused on, but the speaker is diverting or distracting us from the actual issue. Okay, that's the problem we find. And there are six versions of them that your book gives you. So there are fallacies that change the subject of focus. They shift our attention from what we are discussing. I, they shift the attention either by pointing to how many people are following it or, or playing with your emotions or, you know, attacking the circumstances of the person instead of the issue. So we will label them by what they draw our attention to. They are all what fallacies that change the subject. Uh, so was it Zoe that was reading for us? Then Ethel, Ethel can read now. Go ahead, Ethel. Thank you very much, my lady. I've been asking why in Zoom. Let's get Ethel. Yes, please. Fallacies that result from changing the subject. Yes, madam. Number one, grandstanding. Appeal yes. to the masses or appeal to consensus. That's another name for it. Hold on. So look at the word grand stand, big stand. Grand in French is big stand. So when you go to the stadium, the popular stand, where plenty of people are, you see, that's the thinking. You are appealing to the masses, what the plenty of people say, masses, or do do what? Plenty. Appeal to consensus. When we have a, a discussion, we say we want a consensual position. We want the one that many of us agree on, even if not all. So, or do, do it's all playing on what? What plenty of people say, the popular view, the, the masses. It's a fallacy. When we are discussing why we should accept or reject something, argumentation, that is there. And then you tell us that we should accept it because, so when you say because, we are looking for the reason you are offering. Then you point to the number of people supporting it. Do we care how many people are supporting it? It's problematic. And a lot of people said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They crucified the savior. A lot of people, plenty of people said, many people said, popular view. The popular view uh, in, in 2016 was what? JM, 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 comfortable with JM, JM. Before we open our eyes, it's of the city. The popular view has changed from JM to Nanad. Then look at 2020, how hot it was. The popular view was shaky. The fact that many people say something doesn't in itself make it right or wrong. There has to be something that the many people are looking at. So if it's a product, and you say, oh, now a lot of people are buying it, so it is good. We, we will not say because a lot of people are, but we will say it is durable. It is perhaps the durability that is making a lot of people want buy that thing. So emphasize its durability, not the number of people buying. It. If you reason that way, the critical mind says you are shifting the focus of the discussion. You are changing the discussion for more. The reason why we should support or, or, or reject the claim to what the number of people that are following it. That is a fallacy called grandstanding, appeal to the masses, argumentum ad populum. If you look into the textbook, argumentum ad populum, argument of popularity. Okay, that's a Latin expression. For it. Just I read it now. Instead of giving reasons why we should accept your claim, you point to how very many people believe or embrace that claim. Example, yeah. the, the footballers played only for themselves and for the cameras. They didn't play for the team. Ask anyone. Where is the fallacy coming from? What, what is making us detect the fallacy of appeal to the masses? Keep your hand up if you want to try it. What, what in that passage creates the fallacy that we call appeal to the mass? Isaac Egan. Um, please ask everyone. Ask everyone. Thank you very much. As soon as the person added, ask everyone. Would they be so be ahead? No, everybody says so. You know, as soon as you speak that way, oh, auntie, please put my pony on my forehead. Remember our interaction, interactive session one. Put my pony on my forehead. 
So the, the beautician says, okay, I'll do that for you. But may I know why you want it on your forehead? And the sister said, oh, oh, but that is what everyone is doing now. Oh, really? That is what everyone is. Have you checked the size of your forehead? You want it, what everyone is doing. would be into so Look at the extra weight that is on your forehead. You want to put pony two on it because everyone, are you everyone? Oh, I'm a Legon girl, a Legon girl. Hey, that, that's, what, that's what everyone at Legon does. I mean, if you're a Legonite, your wedding, there has to be two buffet or buffet, three of them, a limousine, and it's everyone. The guy you are going to do the wedding with, his salary is 306 pesos, Ghana city, 10 pesos. Transport count, credit, and tight. You say everyone. When you appeal to the masses, you don't reason properly. That's a, that's a problem we have. You have to give us the reason why you're doing the thing. If it coincides with what everyone is, you no problem. But don't say because everyone says so, or many people said so, or that is what is in book, or this. It is problematic. It changes the subject. It's the fallacy. The fallacy. Okay, I think that is well sunk in. If you study it well, you don't have to come and revise this unit again. That is what I'm trying to do. Because you are writing very early. I think it's I'm hearing that it's 10 or so. If you don't get anything, 10. Today is already uh, 3rd May. So perhaps a week from today. Those, has anybody seen the provisional timetable yet? Yes, madam, please. It's 11. Is, is it 10? It's 11. 11. 11. Okay. It's likely you will do it two days. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, every, you all can do it in a day. I, I doubt. Maybe it's one day, all the better for us. So you, you should have a weekend. It, it means just a week today. You see that? So if you can postpone re revision and, and interaction and anything, this is not the only course you would do. But this one's a slap comes very early. So I'm, I'm engaging you in a way that by the time we finish the interactive session, God willing, and with prayers, I'm praying for you, Pa. You don't have to go back to the unit again and go and do so much, if anything, just a quick brush up. So know the fallacies that manipulate the language, Fallacies that manipulate, uh, we haven't gone to manipulate data yet. We are doing fallacy, the second set, those that change the subject. You know the one we call the appeal to the masses. And we have just done, uh, uh, we are now going to do the second one for fallacies that change the subject. Argumentum ad hominem, hominem, homo sapien, from the word homo, hominem, mm, man. The argument of the person, attacking the person. Argumentum ad hominem. When we are discussing and you want to give us reasons why we should accept or reject it, you don't do that. Then you, you shift the issue from giving us reasons to what? Attacking the person you are engaging. His circumstances, where he comes from, his height, for example. Some people said it, and I put it in the example there. This person cannot be a president because he's too short. Look at the reasoning. It was in Ghana here, not far away. He cannot be president. Why? Oh, maybe he doesn't have the competencies. Maybe we, when we look at his record, all the minister, ministries he manned, he didn't manage it them well. You know, stuff like that. Then we can interrogate the reasons you are offering, whether they are deductive or inductive, blah, blah, blah. You see? But the person's reason that he offers is he's too short. What has Hyde got to do with being president? Like it's a crime to be tall or short. In fact, tall or short is relative. <laughs> if I just smart meet that person, maybe he will still be taller. So the point is, when you leave the issue there and start talking about the person, whether positively or negatively, we say you are attacking the person. Argumentum at what? Hominem. If you say, oh, let's accept what he's saying. We say, why? Oh, because he, he comes from my hometown. And, or he attends my church. In my church, people there we are this. And he's, he's this. And he even does that. Oh, so because you know him, that's why you should vote for him. Because he has a handsome face. So you should vote for him, for example. See, it is still labeled as well, attacking the person. The attack is a positive one, but it is still argumentum ad hominem. Except that now we qualify it. We say it's a eulogistic one. While the negative one is called one, this logistic. What's the meaning of eulogize? You praise the person, you logize, you see. The EU, look on your screen, this one, you logistic. So when it is 
accept the view because of the person's circumstances, background, things about the person. We say you are eulogizing the person. It's still ad hominem, I heard one, ad hominem eulogistic. And when you say reject the view because he, uh, he has raped someone, no, that one's bad. No, this one, I want the ones that are very annoyingly ad hominem. You need the issue. <laughs> I think we should listen to what Dr. Miles is saying. They say, why? oh, because she's a female. And you know, she too, she, she, she really speaks good English. And I think she's also this. And she's, all the things you are saying have nothing to do with whether we should switch on the fan or switch it off. You have entered the lecture hall. Your colleague class rep says, no, please. I think that it will be helpful if we rather project the slides than writing it on the board, okay? Then the, the sister sitting next to the classroom says, Doc, I don't think we should do that. So we say, oh, why? You're asking the sister why? He said, this guy, he thinks that because he's a classroom, he can always be bossy. Every day when we come to class, he wants to be the one who speaks first. And because Madame has been calling his name, Nima, 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 Nima. So he thinks, we don't have a classroom here, so don't chill. Eh? Every day, Madame will be saying, oh, Nima, my classroom. So he, every day when we come, he wants to be taught. I think he should sit down. Let us listen to the lecture, period. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> if your only reason why we shouldn't listen to your class is what you said, it's ad hominem, this logistic. You didn't give us any reason. You just attacked the person from start to finish. He thinks he attended at Timota. Or he thinks, she thinks he went to France Mango. Those people, they, they think they know it all. Everything they want to be seen. Here, here today, they can't bring their thing here. They are not listening to what they are saying. <laughs> ad hominem. This logistic. Yeah. You should tell us, oh, God, please. I think that we, we can't listen to what our class rep is saying because the projection doesn't help us in class. You can give us the slides. When you project, all the people sitting to the extreme left don't see the screen. Those at the right don't see it's blurred. But when you write, at least that one, because they are markers, we are able to write it down. But you can give us the slides. That is what I think. But that's why I disagree with you. We can interrogate it. We can even vote. It is reasoning. But when you tell us that we shouldn't listen to the classroom, he thinks he's a classroom, so he must always talk. And he's bossy. And he feels this. And we are all attacking the person. I may ask you to create your own example. You should be able to do it. That's my purpose. With all the examples I'm giving. Okay. Then the eulogistic one. I think that uh, this, but your textbook gives you so many. Let me see if I can find one. I think we should vote for this. Uh, uh -huh. Here's an example. That student wearing the T-shirt saying peer teacher, top eight in Legon Hall, has been hired by an NGO to counsel students about age and sexual relations, especially on campus. I believe what he says about the terrible consequences that you might die if you have unprotected sex or even sex outside marriage. It must be true. See, what the guy says must be true because he is so smart and gets really good grades in his philosophy course. <laughs> The philosophy teachers like him, which is how he got the job. And his father has been an evangelist for over 10 years and has been on TV and even preaches overseas. <laughs> Moreover, my father knows his uncle very well. Wow, <laughs> the idea. <laughs> wow, this is how we do some of our appointments. Wow, the idea. We are talking about going to do counseling for students on unprotected said what sex and what have. what has it got to do with his grace in philosophy so it is ad hominem this is is this eulogistic or this logistic then i'm i shut up is this eulog or this law i want a chorus answer logistic. eulogistic it is eulogistic we are eulogizing we are praising him very good so take note of that i could ask you in the space provider or, or construct like i've said over and over you can remember your eye create an ad hominem eulogistic fallacy from something like that you know you should be able to get it immediately and no waste time at all get your full map and be happy i want you all to get a's a a a a for the whole set of students all the groups not just this group. you can do it you just have to know how to answer critical thinking questions. Why? So, sister, please read to the end, and then we'll move on. Ad hominem. 
attacking the person, you pay attention discussion to the person. If the attack on the person is passive and it's in this logistic ad hominem, but if the attack on is pleasant and laudatory, described as illogistic ad hominem. Example one, we should listen to what Kofi says about the product because Kofi is handsome. He comes from my hometown and he really speaks good. Too. He cannot be a good president because he is too short. So we can tell which one is eulogistic and which one is this logistic and why we should avoid it. And when we see folks doing that, we should point it up. You can't marry someone from that place. Then we say, oh, why? Okay, you can't marry this girl. Say that, that, this one. Say, oh. But this girl doesn't she come from so and so place. This is and this is and this is and this is. So her circumstances mean that. What about her herself? Or what about he himself? You see, so you can't use things about people that are not connected to the discussion you're having to, to either accept or reject it. Maybe. When you do that, we say you are shifting our attention from the focus of the subject to something else. The third one, appeal to illegitimate authority, not an authority that is a legitimate one. You see, an authority is an expert, boss of the area. But when you are appealing to a boss, someone who knows stuff, yes, but not stuff about the issue being discussed, we have a problem with you. We will criticize you for being what? For committing the fallacy of what? Illegitimate, uh, appeal to illegitimate authority. Lewin, Ghanes Lewin, we all know that he will make you laugh. He uh, is a, a comedian of a kind, an actor. But I don't think that when we are talking COVID health, uh, COVID-19 health issue, whether to import more vaccines or not, he is an authority to consult. So if you go and say, for example, that uh, the, the, the COVID-19 vaccine we currently have is not a good one. And I ask you, why do you say so? I say, oh, Lewin, you know, sister, even Lewin said so. You are appealing to an authority, yes, but not a legitimate authority for the discussion in question. We will criticize you for that. The thing is, even if you appeal to authority, we have an issue because the authority could be wrong. Let alone appealing to an illegitimate authority. That's worse. So in the past, if some of you would see uh, the, the paint advert, uh, the laws, paint, move paint, mm, by Bukum, uh, Bukum Banku. Bukum Banku is an expert in boxing. If somebody is taking your husband or your wife and you want to know how to beat the person up, and he says that, look, Hit the, what, what's the name of it? <laughs> you know, he can tell you if you want to hit the person, guy, give him the blow to the side of the head. <laughs> yeah, he's an expert there. He's an expert in boxing. He can give you information on how to weaken an arm robber, for example, who comes into your room and you have to hit him at the place that will let him fall face flat. He can be an expert there. But not when we are talking paint. <laughs> you see, you are appealing to the wrong authority. You need to, okay? If you want to know someone who can get drunk, so we are advertising an, alcohol, an alcoholic beverage, a local one, one that makes people drunk. You want to get someone who drinks to tell you that. Go for it, go for it. Umusa, go for it. Of course, we know that maybe he doesn't even drink in real life, but a personality that is portrayed like that. Or both. So he can tell that this one is smooth and this one is rough and this one the correct one power. You are appealing to an authority. If you go and take this designer brother and he says that, oh yes, oh, custom, uh, then the is smooth or whatever. It doesn't appeal to our our this thing. It's an illegitimate appeal to authority. That is the whole point. If you if you get those practical examples I gave you. So, so you see that better. I like uh, the paint one, for example. I like the azar. Nowadays I don't see it. Often, as a number one, the person who is doing the narration, then the, the views they show. Of course, when I say I like it, it doesn't mean it is it is a better product than the other. I'm just showing how gullible our human our society, especially Ghanaian society, is. They play on our weaknesses. That is why they will use the expert that you lie, you follow, to advertise something that is not an expert in, and people will buy. They need to. They will not look at. They will not look at who uh, the quality of the product. They are looking at who. Who is 
marketing. Who is portraying uh, also, or, or advertising the product? That's all. But if we had some people that would really question that, then you would want to know that the person that you are appealing to is an expert. So the Azar one, you see that you say Azar, number one. Then the painter will say, I have been painting since this, this, this. I painted the church in my hometown from that time to this and to that, from generation to generation. And this, you know, is trying to give you reason why you should believe him. But the other one there is trying to show you that, well, you lost it, paint, we paint. And the person standing there is a star, he has plenty of people following him for, for boxing and for making us happy. You know, he's laughing things and all that. And that's the reason why you go and buy the paint. <laughs> Not really because he knows paint as an expert. That is what appeal to illegitimate authority. Please read through for me. Thank you, Melissa. Please read through for me. Appeal to, illegitimate. Appeal to illegitimate authority, diverting attention from the issue to illegitimate aspects for the field or issue under this example. It must be W. He is the president in the world. Okay, so I think that's straightforward. With Lewin's example, it even comes home with you. Don't get, don't forget also for the fallacy that changed the subject. We did argumentum ad populum, appeal to the masses. We did, look at it, ad hominem, that's argumentum ad hominem, attacking the person. Then we did appeal to illegitimate authority, it has a very big Latin expression. I don't know if you are ready for it. Argumentum ad vericundium. I think. No, you don't have to worry your head over it. Okay. Then we are now on the fourth one: appeal to pity or emotions or vanity. Look, instead of giving us reasons, you invoke pity. You 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 toy with the emotions of what the speaker. And that is what we have a problem with. Okay. So, for example, you, you go to hospital, you are being, you say hospital, uh, the law court, you are being questioned. Then you say, oh, and judge, this is a woman who has gone to pour acid on someone's daughter, has been arrested, she's now in the witness stand, she's been interrogated. They ask her the question. Then she stops answering the lawyer's question, turns to the judge who happens to be a woman or says, and judge, for a woman like me, for a woman like me, please. The girl was following my husband. Are you a woman like me? As soon as she starts doing that, you know that the woman in the judge is supposed to come out. She will, she will start feeling for the person. But when you were pouring the acid on someone else's daughter, you didn't realize that she too she's a woman or her mother is also a woman. You should deal with the issues dispassionately. Take out emotions and pity. Give reasons why you should accept or reject the thing. You go for an interview. They ask you, why do you think you qualify for this job? Then here, see the sister. <laughs> I have really suffered in my life. Right now, Corona is coming. Even what I eat before I come, I don't have it. I had to work from. Hey, Auntie, why do you qualify for the job? I come in to do emotions. Some people will even say, even in the queue outside, I'm the only female here. Oh, everybody here is male. So because of that, so we should give you the job. What kind of? Give us reasons. It's a, it's diversionary eh, to be doing that. And I, I am picking on my ladies because we do that a lot. But when it comes to where we say, eh, what women can do, men can do. But when we we'll get to the torture station, oh, brah, <laughs> brah, please, you <laughs> can't see. And the other say, when you are sister, hmm. in the Kenke queue, if the gentleman comes and wants to jump the queue, you say, hey, you know, honey, well, how? look at the tone of my voice. But when we have to now carry the, the full staff and be like, oh, brown, <laughs> appeal to pity means <laughs> you have left the issue, you are invoking emotion. You didn't do the assignment. When you come and they ask you, why didn't you do it? Oh, talk, please. I'm, I do X, Y, or Z. Is it possible to have another chance? Yes or no? Not <laughs> if I tell you that this has gone through my life, don't <laughs> Hey, some cry. They don't even want to do the, the assessment, but they, they want to get an A. 
Have you forgotten that other people's children to have issues, oh, even no. more than yours? <laughs> oh, no, oh, no, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, they even had issues that went to yours. They don't say it. Because if not, then there shouldn't be any exam. Hmm? There should only be ad get admitted and graduate, admitted and graduate. But there are exams for a reason. People come to school, they work from wherever they are, they close lecture, they go and do a fancy pump, pump pool to get something small. In the evening, they do night security at banks or some places. Daytime, they sleep two hours, three daytime, they are back. So we don't know. Because they, when they come, they are wearing their long borrowed Brazilian hair that they've been wearing since three months ago, but you don't know. People just know how to manage what they have and, and make it clean and neat and are content. So they, so people should stop invoking pity, emotion, and what have you, and reason. Okay, so I have 60 Ghana cities and I have three weeks to go. Can I just keep my <laughs> And avoid going to do another Brazilian. Can I just quickly the Conroe for the next three weeks and keep the 30 cities for my transport to and from school so that I don't have to do, you know. So when you are reasoning, you find opportunities, not when you are always pitching yourself and trying to invoke same in others. Okay, I think I have elaborated enough. So see the example there. A young boy tells the judge, after killing both of his own parents, this doesn't look like Africa. Hmm? Look at what he says. Please have mercy on me because I am an orphan. <laughs> Can you see what is happening there? You are an orphan. Who made you an orphan? After you have killed both of his own parents, when you finish killing them, this is appeal to be a typical example of appeal to pity. And the lawyers amongst those who are doing law, you will see this when you go to a place, they appeal to pity. It changes the subject and it's a fallacy. That one is argumentum ad misericordiam, from the word misery, misericordiam. You can see it in your test if you want to, when you read through them. I don't want to believe that I'll, I'll be asking um, Latin expressions, but when you know it, it should help you. Okay. Now we can move on to the next one. Since I read this last one, then I'll take someone else. Force or fear of instead of given given appeal to con or what will happen that does not believe exam for SRC. It looks like some, your line is it, it looks like we are having breaks. So. I, I thought that was from my end. It looks like we are having breaks from your end. Jesus. Thank you, Emma. Can I have someone else read for me? Let's see if it's, it will work. Okay, thank you so much, my lady. Let's do Erica. Okay. Erica, please read, read uh, our appeal to threat. Right. Fallacies that change the subject. Five, appeal to force, threat or fear or consequences. Instead of giving reasons, you appeal to consequences of what will happen if the listener does not believe or accept what you believe. Hmm. Example, hmm. you should support our SLC president on this demonstration. Otherwise, people will take you for a coward. You will have no friends and after school, you will struggle with getting a job. Can you see how that, that is really... Unfortunately, so the person is not giving you reasons why you should accept or reject. He's threatening you in a, a covert manner, in a hidden manner. It's, it's a threat. Sometimes it's even that a coffee, coffee, go and bath, coffee, go and bath. If you don't bath, I'll show you who will give you food this evening. <laughs> That's the only reason why coffee should go and bath. Stop watching, you are distracting. The only reason why Kofi should go and bath is because if he doesn't bath, he will not eat this evening. What has eating this evening got to do with bath? If you do that, the day Kofi can hustle and get himself some ajana one, ajana two money. He won't bath. 
That's why some people, when they go to boarding house, they never bath, SHS. Bathroom, day, especially our brothers. Young my brothers, eh? They won't bath. Oh, madam. Oh, madam. Three weeks later, I can Yes, Brian. <laughs> because the reason why they will bath in the past will be because it's almost six o'clock. If you don't bath, no it. But that's a threat. You tell the secretary, finish typing those letters before 12 noon. Otherwise, consider yourself fired. That's what the boss is telling the secretary. So the reason why you should finish typing at 12 is because if you don't finish, I'll fire you. If you work with people that way, the day they get a new job, they will drop your job like tissue paper. That has been used, COVID time, tissue paper. They will drop it and they will leave you hanging. At a time that maybe you needed their help to finish some project document and you have a very short time timeline. You see, but if you work with people based on reason, oh, I, I'm telling you, yeah, yeah, that's your secretary now. This is a document here, we should finish by 12. You know, because if we don't finish, we won't be able to go through and organize our presentation for our project interview. That, the project interview is at three. So if we get it done by 12, we can, the team working on it can also present. Why? If you do, if you, Engage with people by reason. Even God says, come, let us reason together. You, you want to be boss. The boss to do, there is no flesh in it. Rebel nullity. The job self, you are not paying. Pressure, sir. If you do that, the sister can drop your job. Maybe she has laid a, a sent applications to other companies. As soon as she gets a yes from any other company, she would leave your job for you. But if you reason with people and you live with people like human beings and you ask their view and what have you, give them reasons why we should do what we are doing. Uh, even if she got a job, a very well paid job that's month, she will say, oh, but I, I would want to finish up stuff in my old place before I come. So can I come on Monday? Today is Friday. Can I have this weekend to do that? Because she wants to organize the place. You only need to know a year. You reasoned with people. Okay? So I'm saying that instead of appealing to consequences, finish typing, otherwise consider yourself fired. What do you mean by that? Is your job the only job in the world? When you do that, you are appealing consequences, appeal to consequences, appeal to force, appeal to threats. Uh, uh, my colleague has an example that is funny. Sometimes I, 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 when I go through my colleagues, I, I, I see some of the examples I want to. There's that uh, Kofi and Kojo, two young boys go and, 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 and play outside. And now Kofi is telling Kojo, Kojo, I think that today, this afternoon, you will let me ride your bicycle. If not, then your mother will know that you beat your sister <laughs> when she went to the party, something like that. The reason why you must let me ride your bicycle is one mommy in fear. They will know that your sister, you beat your sister today. That is the only reason why. It's appeal to threat. Into, you, you know how people will have to now give the bike to people. You didn't give reason. Some, some guys will say, if you don't marry me, I'll kill myself. And I'll tell everybody that uh, you are the reason why I've died. Ah. <laughs> the brother, I'm sure the brother is saying, hey, no, Papa. <laughs> then you would die. I don't love you. Hey, you will marry me. If you don't marry me, I'll kill myself. I'll leave a, a note, a suicide note, and tell them it's because of you I died. Hey, what kind of marriage would that be? Marry me because if I don't marry you, I'm going to kill yourself for me. But if I don't love you too, Anyway, so all those are instances of what? Appeal to threat. You don't have any excuse to say that you can't create one. The questions are tough. But I'm just going to say, you, you should be able to create an appeal to threat fallacy and show why it is one. You should be able to detect one if there is a passage there and it is committing an informal fallacy. These are not technical. You should be able to see as a critical thing. That's how you are wrapping up our post. Okay? And the very last one. Thank you so much. So my, my new lady, Erica, go ahead. Fallacies that change the subject six. Genetic fallacy. Very good. Do you remember that we saw this? We have seen genetic fallacy when we did causal reasoning. If you remember. Uh -huh. When we did causal fallacy, post hoc ego proctor hoc. When we did confusing cause with effect, confusing a correlation for causal connection. The, the third one is ignoring or overlooking a common underlying cause. Then the fifth one I give is genetic fallacy. It's still a causal fallacy. Why? Because the reasoning is about the cause, where it came from, the antecedent of 
of the effect. So it's a causal fallacy that finds itself also an informal fallacy. Okay, sister, please read. Accepting or rejecting a claim just because of its source, its genesis. Example. The new undergraduate system is a copy of the American university system. So it must be an improvement over what we had before. Very good. Now, if, if you saw, there was another example, be also from my friend's slide, I said, uh, uh, I, do not, I don't think we should be wearing rings because uh, wearing of rings was originally a sign of what slavery, for example. A person is accepting or rejecting the wearing of rings on the basis of what its origin, its source, its antecedent. It's a genetic fallacy. Okay, simply that. No, no castle by it. So here to accept or reject something. Here they say we should accept it because it came from a certain place, America. Just that. That's a genetic fallacy. All right. So we are going to the third group of informal fallacies, according to your um, test. Madam. Yes, I'm just. The question is. Please, I wanted to. Yes, please. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, the sit type of changing the subject, the sit one, what we just talked about. Genesis please, is it gen yes, please. The genesis, should it be true, or should it be necessarily true, or it will obviously be true? No, as soon as you are saying that because of where it came from, 90, we should accept it. We have a problem with you, or where it came from, so we should reject it. We have a problem with the reasoning, how you are thinking. If you are saying because it came from Italy, so it is a good product, we should buy it. That's a genetic fallacy. It could come from Italy and not be good. It could come from Italy and be good. So don't tell us that it is good because it came from Italy. Tell us it is good because it has nutrients inside. Look at this one. They did it well. If it's a shoe, then I look at the leather. It takes long before it to, to uh, wear off. Tell us those ones. Don't distract our attention by pointing to where it came from the source. This is our problem. The critical thing. And some tools say, hey, this one, the Ghana can tell. Correct one, Ghanaian can tell. Let me see. You used, you say Ghanaian can tell, so what? So it is good. What, what is it Ghanaian can tell? We are pointing to the source. We are saying that tell us that we used good yarns. If you say the good yarns from Ghana, that you are not distracting us now. You are pointing to the quality. You are giving us reasons. But if you are telling us, oh, this is this one is China, China good, so it's not good. It's a fallacy, genetic fallacy, because there can be things from China that are good. All right. So I don't know if that helps you. Oh, okay, madam. Hey, madam. Please, I also wanted to ask about the illegitimate that one. Appeal to authority. Yes, please. Should it be that? Yes, I wanted to ask that. Should it be necessarily like um, not somebody who is of the right person, not a legitimate person that we know that, yes, if you, the like, person, Yes, the person is an authority, an expert, a known figure. Okay, we don't have a problem with that. But he's a, an expert in another failed. Maybe he's an, uh, he's a, uh, what example can I give? He's an actor. So he knows acting. We respect him for acting. But what we are talking about is not acting. We're talking about health. GDP, for example. Then the actor is saying that uh, our inflation must, uh, must be reduced to this. A bank, bank exchange rate must be reduced to 40%. Are you an expert in banking? So when you you the one speaking, you appeal to someone who is not an authority. You say, oh, this is our uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine for our, that they are importing. They say we have to stop importing it because they don't do anything to our health. Then I ask you, why should we accept what you ask? You say, oh, because Lewin said it. Okay, Lewin, Ghana Lewin. Lewin said this COVID-19 vaccine. They don't really add anything to our health situation. So we should stop importing. So you, the one arguing, your, your justification, the, the grounds you are offering is what Lewin, what Lewin said. We love Lewin, we may appreciate him, we may value him, but not in health issues. He's not a health expert. He's an actor. 
He's like, maybe an entrepreneur of a kind of thing. Okay, but he's not a health expert to be talking about whether or not we should accept COVID-19. So if you, the one speaking, you are appealing to the women to support the claim you are making, which claim about health, then we say you are appealing to an illegitimate courage. So that's the point. I think it's clear now. Yes, please. All right, read the text to Zakrawai. Let's see if it's okay. We are doing the third set. And I, Erica, can you quickly continue reading it for us? Informal fallacies. Yes, fallacies that re results from manipulation of data. One, hasty generalization. Take note of this, this name, pa. Generalizing in a haste. You are in a hurry to generalize. So you have some data. Some ev data here means what? Evidence. Mm, the, the premises. So the, this fallacy, this a new set of fallacies we are dealing with. They manipulate the data. They play on the evidence available. It's not the language. They're not playing on the language, but the evidence. You have some evidence. You have some data. You have some premises. But it cannot do what you want the conclusion. In other words, it cannot support the conclusion you are drawing. You are manipulating that data. That, that is that the nature of this reason. So which one do we call hasty generalization? Remember enumerative induction, unit five. Now we brought it to unit seven. You get instances of me particular metals that expanded when heating. So you draw a conclusion, therefore, that all metals expand when heating. You could co commit hasty generalization if you argue that way. From few instances, friends, you generalize about the whole. So Yaya is a lady, she cheated. Adwa is a lady, she cheated. Mansa is also a lady, she cheated. Therefore, you conclude that all ladies cheat. You have concluded in a haste. Open them a button. You are in a hurry to draw a conclusion from the few insufficient evidence you had at your disposal. You draw a conclusion about the whole population set. Let's read. Hasty generalization, insufficient evidence. Drawing a general conclusion from a sample that is considered insufficient. Example. All the three guys I have been with were cheats. So guys are cheats. So guys are cheats. As for this, all the this, this that I did, they did this. Therefore, all these are this. When you argue that way, you say you are generalizing in the hit. You are playing on the small evidence you have at your disposal. Said that already. To make a generalization about the whole. Very good. Now sometimes when you this when you you may be committing hasty generalization, but you are emphasizing something which is misplaced in your premises. Yeah? This one is a little technical, so listen to me. Well, it is like hasty generalization, it's still playing on what the evidence. But here, it is a misplaced vividness. You are being vivid, you are, you are being emphatic about something. But that thing you are being emphatic on shifts a little from what your premises are about. You are, you are making a certain conclusion, but the premises you are offering to draw that conclusion is misplaced, has shifted. You are talking about something else and drawing conclusion about some, some other thing. That's why we, we labeled it under fallacies of irrelevance. What you are saying is not relevant to what we are discussing. And finally, that's why fallacies that change the subject were also placed under that category, that they are fallacies of relevance. It means the premises you are offering, the supposed premises, are irrelevant to the discussion. There are many people support something. Is it relevant to the conclusion we are drawing? Okay. The same with this set of fallacies also. You are shifting attention. So what you are saying is not relevant to the conclusion you are drawing. Not just insufficient, but it's also not about the conclusion you are drawing. It's a misplaced emphasis you are laying. Okay. Uh, th this is one example. I'll find one or two others from the text before. So sister read. It's quite tiny, so if you can't see, I can read it for you. Misplaced vividness. Deflection of attention by focusing too much on a particularly sensational and provocative instance, which is irrelevant to the matter being discussed to, to support your claim. Sometimes this fallacy is also considered a fallacy of insufficient evidence. Very good. Example. Why are women always complaining about economic inequality? 
there is plenty of economic equality. The former prime minister of the UK was a woman. The former head of, bio, of the biochemistry department, Alagon, was a woman. And so was the former and current pro vice chancellors. Also, the former president of Liberia, current, presi current vice president of the USA, and current chief of staff of Ghana. So there really is no economic inequality between men and women. The problem is just a figment of the average woman's jealous imagination. The all fact right. that all these uh -huh. women occupy big positions does not address the actual issue about, in, about economic inequality between men and women. Not only is the evidence insufficient, but these examples are also irrelevant to the issue of economic inequality and the emphasis in the example is misplaced. It's misplaced. It's, it's uh, extremely emotional. Okay, let's give one, one other example. That these are, this is directly from your test. I didn't add or subtract anything. There's another example there. I saw one of my friends dying of AIDS and at first he refused treatment because he was afraid of what people would think. For his whole life, he never saw a conventional doctor nor went to a clinic. Finally, he went into hospital and stayed there for the first time where he was given antiretrovirals for one week. And then after some weeks, he started to feel better while under hospital care. Then after four weeks, he died. So see the conclusion from that one instance, which was traumatic and sensational. And, you know, it wasn't too pleasant. From that one unpleasant, traumatic, sensational example, mm -hmm. there comes the person's conclusion. So clearly, the antiretrovirals should be prescribed to everyone all over Africa who has it. <laughs> I mean, you see, so it's like hasty generalization. From one instance, you are drawing a, a conclusion about the whole. However, that conclusion you are drawing is misplaced. One example said, whenever I jogged uh, around, I, I saw some people playing tennis, and one of them uh, fell and broke his, his leg. And since then, he has never walked. So that is why it is. I have, I have always said that as for tennis party, no one should play something. You see that kind of way of reasoning. What happened? Traumatic, not pleasant. It's just one instance. And it might not even be connected to the playing of tennis per se. It is an accident. That okay. One or two. The person will conclude that. So it is really, really dangerous to play tennis. And that is why I would rather prefer uh, uh, sports that don't involve tennis. It is insufficient evidence based on which you are drawing a conclusion. Not just that, it would have done, it would have qualified to be what? Hasty generalization. But it goes further. It is sensational. You see, because that evidence you are drawing a conclusion from hmm, was traumatic sensational not pleasant so you make you generalize from such a misplaced vivid conclusion you just know that it looks like a hasty generalization but it is not exactly that because this one play it it, it, it. how do i even do it without sounding too technical okay it is it is misplaced it has shifted from so there is no relevant connection between the premises you're offering and that conclusion you are drawing. okay the final one Semi-attached figures. And lady, please read that to us. Get your textbook examples as well, and then engage the recorded lecture for my colleague. Some of the content, aha, uh -huh, let me say this before I forget. Some of the content in the delivered lectures, the recorded lectures, are for elaboration. So if you don't see them in the exam, don't worry your head over. Like the causal fallacy, like I, I played the some of, some of the content are not in the textbook in the elaboration, when the, the lecture recording is telling you, it's, it is not in the test. The test book is our foundational content. So it, it can help your understanding, but it will not be, it will not use that to examine if it is not in the test, even if it is in the recorded interactive section. So we have a fair grounds for assessment, and then there's a place to reference our content all the time, okay? So everything I, I present to you, I make sure it is directly from the test book as we have been given, that's our guide. When we change and improve it and add or subtract, we can use that. But it has to be a standard text. 
for everyone. Okay, so the delivered lectures, the recorded one in your dosia plus whichever one other colleagues and myself are giving you, are all supposed to fit into what the foundational content, which is the test. So you study with a lot of experience and smartness. There might be examples I'm giving you there. I'm saying common thread. I see that in some of the slides. Common thread is not in your test. But it is another word for method of agreement, J.S. Mills's method. So you won't see common thread in your exam, not because it is not correct or it's not in the video. You will see the method of agreement. All right? Okay. So since I read this last one and then we are done. Semi attached figures. Yo. Intimidating listeners or readers with numerical details that give the impression that a conclusion has been meticulously researched. When in reality, the mathematical figures attached to the data only divert attention because the issue being discussed does not lend itself to precise measurement. So you see that this one looks like what we, we studied earlier. And your textbook doesn't help us out too much with it either. If you look at the earlier discussion of pseudo precision and mathematical mystification, you compare that to semi-attached figures, you would see some, some overlap there. So when do we call it semi-attached figures? When we are dealing with the data, when we are dealing with evidence produced, then we'll call that kind of a, a passage or fallacy what semi-attached figures, because we are, we are interpreting the data, the supporting data for that conclusion. But when we are interrogating the language of it, then we'll call it pseudo-precision. So there's an overlap there. What should, what should you know about the nature of this fallacy? It's simply when you are pretending to be precise, then we go again, by attaching figures, suggesting, uh, suggesting what? Metic, as if you are being exact, and meticulous, and per, per, you know, you are trying to do as if you are very exact. And it is all because of the figures you are adding to the supposed data over there. Okay, since I read it and let's see the example there. Example, a research, a research team from Boston College discovered that at Lagon, over the three-year period, 2001 to 2004, 75.3% of enrolled university students were spiritually motivated. Hmm. But in Ibadan, over the same period, only 58.7% of the students were found to be spiritually motivated. Very good. How do you measure spiritual motivation precisely? Precisely, with precision, for you to get to 75.3. 3, .3 sometimes they will say 75.376%. Meanwhile, what you are qualifying cannot have precision. Okay, so, so I'm sure some of you may be asked, okay, then I get it. Let me attach figures and mathematical mystification and pseudo precision seem to overlap. Okay, they seem to be overlap, uh, to, to overlap. Let's look at what we see in your test. Let me attach figures. One way of intimidating listeners and readers is to overwhelm them with numerical details that give the impression of a conclusion, uh, impression that a conclusion has been meticulously researched. But on the contrary, sometimes these mathematical flourishes deflect attention from the subject matter if they are attached to attributes or qualities that do not lend themselves to precise measure. That's what you see on the screen. Okay, uh, where is it? For a very comprehensive example of semi-attached figure, the critiques applied by so-and-so-and-so -and -so theory of apartheid South Africa says, da, 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 is there. That critique is under mathematical mystification, pseudo precision which is also in your test. So you see that your test book itself admits of a certain kind of overlap. Therefore, when I'm helping students understand the supposed difference that we make here, we say that when you are dealing with the entire evidence produced, the evidence, so you are looking at the data supporting that conclusion, then you label that fallacy as well, semi-attached figure. But when you are looking at the language of it, then you can call it pseudo precision, else they don't vary at all. Now, this last very important thing, note is on the screen now, one passage may commit more than one fallacy. So the fallacy that is appealing to an illegitimate authority may also be ad hominem, if you're attacking the person, you see that. Or 
the fallacy that is appealing to the masses may also be committing something else. So one person may commit more than one fallacy. That's why normally, if you are asked to identify which of the which fallacy is being committed somewhere, it will be followed with what and why, so that your why will tell us what you see. So you could say it is a fallacy that appeals to the masses because the speaker is asking or supporting his views based on how many people follow it. And we know that you know appeal to the masses. Or someone will say this is ad hominem because they have left the issue being discussed and they're talking about the circumstances of the person. Maybe you logistic, okay, and so on and so forth. Two, one fallacy may belong to the different categories and that's what is important to me now. The fallacy may be one, like the one we just seen, semi-attached figures, but may belong to different categories. You see, so the categorization is just a way of helping us think. Like you can, can group men and women by saying, oh, those who have long hair are women, those who have short hair are men. But you know that you could have long-haired women who a uh, long-haired men. In other words, people who are long-haired, but they are not women. So it is not a strict mutually exclusive categorization. That is very important to help your understanding. The point is to know the fallacy itself, not necessarily which category it belongs to, because it could belong to more than one. That settles it for most of you now. Then the last one, more examples are available in the test book. Study them. Why? So that it will help your understanding. Any questions? We are done. Thank you very much, Erica and all those who read for me. I'm ready to take any questions you may have. Sarah, Madam I guess you want to read for me. Hey, guys, is that what? Madam, please, um, between the hasty generalization and then enumerative induction. Enumerative, they... enumerative induction is a type of induction, which if you do, could create a hasty generalization fallacy. OK, so one leads to the other. In other words, one is, there are two different things. One is describing the type of reasoning, the way you are reasoning. You are reasoning enumeratively. So you are counting to arrive at your conclusion. That is why we call it enumerative induction. Now, if you do enumerative induction, you may generalize in a history. Unless maybe you had 200 million instances based on which you drew your conclusion. Then we cannot say you have committed hasty generalization. You see that? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, uh -huh. but if, if you do an emotive induction, you don't do it well, you don't have enough evidence, and based on that, we're generalized. We could criticize you for what? Uh, committing hasty generalization. Yeah. Let me take uh, Joseph. Joseph Eshen. If it's a question. Your hand is up, Joseph. So ask your question, please. Yeah, Joseph. Joseph Aloysius. I don't know if I pronounce your name. Joseph Ishen Aloysius. Unmute your mic and ask your question, please. Okay, Erica, are you sorted now? Your hand is still up. Okay, let's take Sairam Akusa. Oh, yes, Madam. I wanted you to please go over the difference between the semi attached figures and the other one. Have you read it at all in your textbook? Oh, I can't hear you. Have you read it, Sarah? Yes, madam. Have you read it? Yes, please. I don't like it when students lie. Uh, and <laughs> have you read? Ah, uh, like before this lecture. My uh, sister, no, have you please. read it? No, please. Engage it. If you if you re read it and you still have a question, send me a message. I will help you out. Okay. This thing is, has been okay. recorded too, okay? I really don't want to send more recordings. You will have too much work to do. But the content, mathematical mystification, I, you are qualifying the thing with math, mathematical figures. Meanwhile, 
the concept you are dealing with is vague. Because the concept you are dealing with is vague, no matter how you qualify it with your so-called research that you've done, figures, 66.77, we have a problem because what you say you checked, how do you measure the motivation, people's spiritual motivation, how do you measure it? Will you use how many times they attend church or how they give or what? People do all of that and they are not doing anything spiritual. They, they are just chasing a certain sister at the church there. Some the tongues sizes that they have, they are syllables of tongues. It's not a joke. But right after that, the offering of prayer, they steal it before they go. How do you measure spiritual much? It's a vague concept. We have discussed vagueness. So when we critique that that reasoning part, the person arguing, and then we say you are just being pseudo-precise. We are saying that the very concept that you have entailed in your argument, that concept cannot have precision as, as associated with it, okay? And therefore, the reasoning, the argumentation, I will not interrogate it. You are just looking at the term you are qualifying with 60.449% now, they are showing. That's 60.449%. It's just a mathematical mystification. You are mystifying us. You are scaring us with mathematical figures. So we shut up and say that, hey, the thing is, 64.99% to you. But you are not being precise because the concept you are dealing with cannot be precise. That is mathematical mystification, also called pseudo precision. Now, when we bring that same discussion down to where we are dealing with the data itself, the data here is not just the language, the specific statement inside your, your reason, but we are looking at the entire evidence you have. Because of this problem we have, we will say that your data is what? Dealing with what? A semi-attached figure. The figure doesn't fully attach to your evidence. It is hanging. This, based on the same issue we have, but now we are, we are dealing with the data, the evidence, the whole evidence, not the language of what? The specific content of that evidence. So we are not looking at just one premise and the, the specific uh, mathematical percentage you have there and how it's qualified something. You are looking at the whole data evidence you are proposing to support your thing. They overlap. But one is focusing on what? The premises, all the premises, that's the data. A semi attached figure is focusing on all the data you are giving, the premises you are offering, while the other one is interrogating the component statement, the language of your argumentation. Okay, that should help you because the textbook doesn't clarify so much. It's even things of them the same way. It tells you that if you want an example of this one, look at what happens under mathematical mystification and pseudo position. Just repeat the same examples there. Okay, so you should do fine. I think that for examination purposes, what you should be more concerned about will be for these ones that we have just done, will be the names, how you identify one and why. And we have seen some three categorizations. We still admit that they can overlap. Those are the main things that should be done. All right, let me take Eliza Afo. That'll be the last one. Unless Aloysius is ready with his question. If not, I take a... Uh, Eliza Afo. Eliza, go ahead. Eliza, go ahead, please. You are muted. 